Chapter 2, Sigmund Freud. Freud observed that humans have had three major blows to their self-esteem. The first came from Copernicus, who demonstrated the Earth was not the center of the universe, as humans had so egotistically believed. In fact, Copernicus demonstrated the Earth was not even the center of our solar system, a fact that was not easily digested. The second blow came from the work of Charles Darwin, who demonstrated humans were not the product of special creation, but were descended from and continuous uh, with the so-called lower animals. As the dust caused by Darwin's revelations was settling, our self-esteem was salvaged by the belief that humans were rational animals. Although we descended from lower animals somewhere in the process of evolution, we became qualitatively different from them by becoming dependent on our intellect. Animals were driven by instinct. Only human behavior was rationally determined. It was Freud who dealt the third blow to human self-esteem, when he contended that human behavior is primarily instinctive and motivated mainly by unconscious processes. In other words, according to Freud, most humans are anything but rational animals. Whether we agree with Freud's theory or not, Freudian concepts have completely revised the way we view human nature. Biographical sketch. It's here to summarize Freud's biography. Sigmund Freud was born on May 6, 1856, in Freilberg, Austria, now Prybert Czech Republic. When Freud was four years old, he and his family moved to Vienna, where he continued to live for nearly 80 years. His father, Jacob, was, not too, was a not-too-successful wool merchant and a strict authoritarian. At the time of Freud's birth, his father was 40 years old, and his mother, who was his father's third wife, was a youthful 20. Freud was the first of eight children born to his mother, Amelie Nathanson Freud, in the course of 10 years. One son, however, died at the age of seven months when Sigmund was two years old. Columbo, 2010, provides evidence of Freud being sexually molested by his nursemaid when he was a young boy. It was an event that Freud would later, in a letter to his friend Wilhelm Fleiss, call the prime originator of his own psychological neurosis. This event would prove highly influential in Freud's development of theory and practice. He entered medical school at the University of Vienna when he was 17 years old, but it took him almost eight years to finish a four-year medical program, mainly because he pursued many interests outside of medicine. Freud chose medical school because medicine was one of the few careers open to a Jew in Austria at the time. Although not interested in becoming a physician, he saw the study of medicine as a vehicle for engaging in scientific research. Freud hoped to become a professor of neurology and published several highly regarded articles on the topic. He soon discovered, however, that because he was Jewish, advancement within the academic ranks would be extremely slow. This realization, along with the fact that he needed money, prompted him to enter private practice as a clinical neurologist on April 25, 1886. About five months later, on September 13, 1886, he was finally able to marry Martha Bernays, to whom he had been engaged since 1882. During their five-year engagement, Freud wrote more than 400 letters to his fiancée. They remained married until Freud's death. They had six children, three daughters, and three sons. One daughter, Anna, became a famous child analyst in London. The Cocaine Incident In 1884, Freud began experimenting with cocaine after hearing from a German army physician that the drug enhanced the endurance of soldiers. Freud found it relieved depression and increased his ability to concentrate. Furthermore, he believed it had no negative side effects. Freud took it freely himself and gave it to Martha, his sisters, his friends, and his colleagues. Eventually, Freud published six articles on cocaine, recommending it as a stimulant, local anesthetic, cure for indigestion, and harmless substitute for morphine. One of Freud's associates, Carol Kohler, learned from Freud that cocaine could be used as an anesthetic during eye operations, and Kohler presented a paper describing the experiment in which it was successfully used as such. Kohler's paper caused a sensation and brought him worldwide fame almost overnight. Freud deeply regretted just having misreceiving this professional recognition himself. Although cocaine was of value in eye surgery, Freud's other beliefs concerning the magical substance were soon proven false. Reports of cocaine addiction began to pour in from all over the world, and cocaine came under a heavy attack from the medical community. Freud's association with a harmful drug contributed to the skepticism with which his medical colleagues treated his later ideas. Although Freud avoided addiction to cocaine, he did become addicted to nicotine. For most of his adult life, he smoked an average of 20 cigars a day. In 1923, Freud was diagnosed with cancer of the mouth, which was linked to smoking, 
a habit he did not abandon even after his cancer was detected. From 1923 to his death in 1939, Freud underwent 33 operations. Although in constant pain because of his refusal to accept pain-reducing drugs, his mind remained alert and he worked on his theory until the end of his life. Three Influences on Freud's Theory Freud's Visit with Charcot In 1885, Freud received a small grant that allowed him to study with the famous French neurologist Jean-Martin Charcot, who was experimenting with hypnotism. After hypnotizing a patient, Charcot demonstrated that various types of paralysis could be created and removed artificially through the inducement of the hypnos hypnotist. Thus, he demonstrated that physical symptoms could have a psychological origin as well as a physical or organic origin. Charcot's observations had clear implications for the treatment of hysteria. Hysteria is a term used to describe a wide variety of symptoms such as paralysis, loss of sensation, and disturbances of sight and speech. Originally, it was assumed that hysteria was exclusively a female disorder. Hystera is the Greek word for uterus. Because it was often impossible to find anything organically wrong with hysteric patients, the medical community intended to view them as uh, maligners, and the physicians who agreed to treat them were typically discredited. Charcot's research indicated that the physical symptoms of hysteric patients could be psychogenic, and therefore the disease might be taken seriously. Charcot also convincingly demonstrated that, contrary to what most physicians had believed, hysteria was not exclusively female disorder. Freud's visit with Bernheim. After Freud returned from his visit with Charcot, he attempted to use hypnotism in his private practice, but was only partially successful. In an effort to improvise his skills as a hypnotist, Freud returned to France in 1889. This time, however, he visited Hippolyte Bernheim in Nancy. Like Charcot and his colleagues, members of the Nancy School were experimenting with hypnosis as a means of treating hysteria. Freud learned information from this visit that profoundly influenced both his later theorizing and his therapeutic method. Bernheim hypnotized people, and while they were under hypnosis, he had them perform various acts. While they were still under hypnosis, he instructed them to forget what they had done under hypnosis when they awoke. This created post-hypnotic amnesia. That is, the person was unable to recall what he or she had done while hypnotized. Bernheim demonstrated that the amnesia was not complete, however. He showed that if the hypnotist insisted strongly and convincingly, the memory would return. To facilitate this recall, Bernheim placed his hand on the forehead of the awake person as he insisted the events that occurred during the hypnotic session be remembered. Freud learned from Bernheim that persons can have memories they are not aware of. However, under pressure, these memories can be retrieved. A second important lesson that Freud learned from Bernheim involved post-hypnotic suggestion. To demonstrate this phenomenon, Bernheim hypnotized a woman and told her that after waking, she would walk over to the corner of the room, pick up the umbrella that was found there, and open it. After being aroused from the hypnotic trance, she did exactly that. When questioned as to why she had opened the umbrella, the woman said she wanted to see if it belonged to her. Freud learned from this that behavior can be caused by ideas of which a person is totally unaware. Freud got many of the ideas that were later to characterize psychoanalysis from Charcot and Bernheim. Many others he got from Joseph Brewer. Joseph Brewer and the case of Anna O. Freud first met Joseph Brewer in, at the University of Vienna when both men were engaged in neurological research in the late 1870s. Brewer gave Freud advice, ad, uh, advice, friendship, and loaned him money. Most important for the development of psychoanalysis, however, was Brewer's treatment of a young woman referred to anonymously as Fräulein Anna O. Anna O. was 21 years old when Brewer began treating her in December of 1880-something, and her treatment continued until June 1882. Anna O.'s symptoms included paralysis of various parts of her body, problems with vision, periodic deafness, a nervous cough, periodic aversion to nourishment and liquids, suicidal impulses, various hallucinations, and an occasional inability to speak in her native German language, while retaining an, in, uh, retaining an ability to speak in English. Anna O.'s condition was diagnosed as hysteria. Much to his amazement, Brewer found that if Anna O. traces symptoms to its original occurrence, it disappeared either temporarily or permanently. Brewer found that Anna O. was able to discuss the origins of her various symptoms while she was either hypnotized or when she was very relaxed. Working several hours each day for more than a year, 
Brewer systematic to remove each of Anna O's symptoms in this manner. Anna O herself called this lab laborious procedure the talking cure, or chimney sweeping. Brewer, Brewer called it catharsis. Aristotle had originally used this term to describe the emotional release and feeling of purification that an audience experiences while viewing a drama. Several important facts were learned from Brewer's treatment of Anna O. Perhaps the most important was that her condition improved when she openly expressed her feelings. Brewer also observed that this that as a treatment continued, Anna O began transferring to him the feelings she had toward her father. This phenomenon, in which a patient responds to the analysis as if he or she were an important person in the patient's life, is called transference. Freud would later consider transference a vital part of effective psychoanalysis. Likewise, Brewer was becoming emotionally involved with Anna O. The phenomenon of an analysis forming an emotional attachment to a patient was later called countertransference. Because of the considerable amounts of time Brewer was spending with Anna O and the deep feelings they were developing toward each other, Brewer's marriage, light, marriage began to suffer. As a result, he decided to, stay, to stop seeing his patient. Brewer concluded that his, treat, concluded, concluded his treatment with Anna O was successful. It turns out, however, that this was not exactly true. Jones identified Anna O as Bertha Pappenheim, and we review some of the details of her life next. The Fate of Bertha Pappenheim Through some clever detective work, Ellenberger was able to discover what happened to Bertha Pappenheim after Brewer terminated her treatment. Documents uncovered by Ellenberger indicate that she was admitted into some place in 1882, still suffering from many of the same ailments described earlier by Brewer. While at the sanatorium, she was treated with substantial amounts of morphine, and the record shows that she continued to receive injections of morphine after her release from the sanatorium several months later. Little is known about the next few years of her life, but she eventually emerged as a social worker in the late 1880s. Her accomplishments thereafter were truly impressive. She was the director of an orphanage in Frankfurt for 12 years. She founded a League of Jewish Women. She founded a home for unwed mothers. She traveled to the Near East, Poland, Russia, and Romania to help orphan children and help solve the problems of prostitution and white slavery. She became a leader in the European feminist movement, and she became a playwright and an author of children's stories. In addition, she was an outspoken opponent of abortion. Throughout her professional life, Bertha Pappenheim maintained a negative attitude toward psychoanalysts and never allowed any one of the girls under her care to be psychoanalyzed. By the time she died in March 1936, she had become an almost legendary figure and tributes to her, became, tributes to her came from prominent persons throughout Europe. In 1954, the German government issued a stamp bearing her picture in honor of her as part of a series of stamps paying tribute to helpers of humanity. The relationship between Pappenheim's ultimate success and her early experiences, including her treatment by Brewer, is still being debated. The Development of Free Association Understanding the Significance and Development of Free Association Influenced by what he had observed during his visits with Charcot and Bernheim, Freud tried to, hype, tried to hypnosis in his practice but was not satisfied with the results. Freud eventually gave up hypnosis because he found that not all his patients could be hypnotized. One of his patients, Frau Emmy von Inn, became furious with him over his constant interruptions while trying to hypnotize her. She expressed the desire simply to be allowed to speak her mind without being interrupted. Next, Freud tried hand pressure, the technique he learned from Bernheim, instead of hypnosis. He would place his hand on his patient's foreheads and instruct them to begin talking when he releases the pressure. Although this technique was somewhat successful, he eventually abandoned it and settled on free association, which he called the fundamental rule of psychoanalysis. Freud's experiences with hypnosis and hand pressure and his recollection of an essay by Ludwig Born, which had been given to him when he was 14, gradually evolved into the technique of free association. Born's essay titled The Art of Becoming an Original Writer in Three Days encouraged the budding writer to take pen and paper and write without fabrication or hypocrisy everything that comes into your head. The writer was encouraged to write more or less randomly about him or herself, about historic events, or about other assorted people. Born guaranteed that three days' of activity would bring astonishment. Brewer and Freud worked on several cases of hysteria and in 1895 published the book Studies on Hysteria, which is usually considered the beginning of psychoanalytic analytic movement. Although their book is now regarded as having monumental significance, 
It then was met with negative reviews, and it took 13 years to sell 626 copies. Brewer and Freud, who had been extremely close friends, soon parted company because of Freud's insistence that sexual conflicts were the cause of hysteria. Brewer agreed that sexual conflicts were often the cause of mental disorders, but disagreed with Freud's contention that they were the only cause. Freud began his highly influential self-analysis in 1897. He began this self-analysis for both theoretical and personal reasons. For example, he had a dread of railroad travel and was preoccupied with thoughts of his own death. The main vehicle in this self-analysis was the interpretation of his dreams. This analysis finally resulted in what many consider Freud's greatest work, The Interpretation of Dreams, published in 1900. As with his earlier book, written with Brewer, this one also met with considerable criticism. It was eight years before 600 copies were sold, for which Freud received the equivalent of $209. Eventually, however, the importance of the book was realized, and it was translated and published throughout the world. It was after the publication of The Interpretation of Dreams that, psych that the psychoanalytic movement began to gain movement. International recognition finally came when Freud and a few of his close followers were invited by G. Stanley Hall to give a series of lectures at Clark University in 1909. Although Freud did not care much for the United States and never returned, he looked on his visit to Clark University as significant in the development of the psychoanalytic movement. When the Nazis came to power in 1933, they publicly burned Freud's books in Berlin, as a Nazi spokesman shouted, Against the soul-destroying overestimation of the sex life and on behalf of the nobility of the human soul, I offer to the flames the writings of one Sigmund Freud. About this event, Freud commented, What progress we are making. In the Middle Ages, they would have burnt me. Nowadays, they are content with burning my books. Freud resisted leaving Vienna even after it was invaded in 1938. Finally, after his daughter, Anna, had been arrested and interrogated by the Nazis, he agreed to go to London. Four of his sisters were later killed by the Nazis in Austria. In London, the Freuds took up residence at 20 Maresfield Gardens in Hampstead in north of the city. Here, in great pain, Freud continued to write, see patients, and occasionally attend meetings of the London Psychoanalytic Society. He died with the assistance of his physician on September 23, 1939. Instincts and their Characteristics for, for Freud, all aspects of the human personality are derived from biological instincts. This point cannot be stressed too much. No matter how lofty the thought or the accomplishment, it ultimately relates to the satisfaction of a biological need. Freud's theory is a hedonistic one. It assumes that humans, like other animals, continually seek pleasure and avoid pain. When all the bodily needs are satisfied, one experiences pleasure. When one or more needs are not satisfied, one experiences discomfort. The main motive for humans, then, is to obtain the steady state that one experiences when all of one's biological needs are satisfied. An instinct has four characteristics. One, a source, which is a bodily deficiency of some kind. Two, an aim, which is, both removed, which is to remove the bodily deficiency, thereby reestablishing an internal balance. Three, an object, which is the experience or object that reduces or removes the bodily deficiency. And four, an impetus, which is determined by the magnitude of the bodily deficiency. For example, a person experiencing the hunger instinct will need food, source, will want to eliminate the need for food, aim, and will seek and ingest food, object. The intensity with which these action, activities occur will depend on how long the person has gone without food, impetus. Life and death instincts. All the instincts associated with the preservation of life are called the life instincts, and the psychic energy associated with them collectively is called libido. In Freud's earlier writings, he equated libido with sexual energy. But in light of increased evidence to the contrary, and because of severe criticism from even his closest colleagues, he expanded the notion to include the energy associated with all of life instincts, including sex, hunger, and thirst. Freud's final position was that libidinal energy is expanded expended to prolong life, for it also referred to life instincts collectively as eros. The death instinct, thanatos, stimulates a person to return to the inorganic state that preceded life. Death is the ultimate steady state because there is no longer a struggle to satisfy biological needs. Quoting, quoting Schopenhauer, Freud claimed, the aim of all life is death. 
The most important derivative of the death instinct, or the death wish, as it is sometimes called, is aggression. According to Freud, aggression is the need for self-destruction turned outward to objects other than the self. Cruelty, murder, and other forms of aggressions were thought by Freud to derive from the death instinct. Even though Freud never developed Thanatos as fully as Eros, it is nonetheless an important part of his theory. Divisions of the Mind The Id the mature adult mind has three divisions, an id, an ego, and a superego. At birth, however, the entire mind consists only uh, of, of only the id, from the German das es, meaning the it. The it consists of pure, unadulterated, instinctual energy and exists completely on the unconscious level. The it cannot tolerate the tension associated with a bodily need and therefore demands the immediate removal of that tension. In other words, the id demands immediate gratification of bodily needs and is said to be governed by the pleasure principle. The id has two means of satisfying bodily needs, reflex action and wish fulfillment. Reflex action is responding automatically to a source of irritation. For example, an infant may sneeze in response to an irritant in the, in the nose or reflexively move a confined limb, thereby freeing it. In both cases, Reflex action re act effectively reduces tension. Coughing and blinking are also examples of reflex action. Wish fulfillment is more complicated. In addition to the characteristics of, intense, of instincts described earlier, instincts can be considered mental representations of physiological needs. It is within the id and the via the concept of instinct that Freud came to grips with the mind-body question. The mind-body question asks, how biological events and psychological events are related to each other. It is a question that every theory with a cognitive comp component eventually must address. Freud's answer to the mind question, mind body question was as follows. A biological deficiency, a need, triggers in the id an attempt to reduce the tension associated with that need by imagining an object or event that will satisfy the need. For example, the need for food will automatically trigger in the id a food-related image that has the effect of temporarily reducing the tension associated with the need for food. This is called wish fulfillment. At this point, Freud becomes quite mystical. Because the id is entirely unconscious, what images does it conjure in response to the various needs? Certainly, it cannot conjure a fish taco in response to the hunger derived because it never experienced a fish taco or anything else that is directly related to the reduction of hunger drive. The alternative seems to be that the id has available to it the inherited residuals of experience from preceding generations. Thus, it can access the images of things that consistently satisfy the needs of humans through many past generations. It is later viewed, it is the latter view that Freud accepted, and in, do, in so doing, he embraced Lamarck's notion of the inheritance of acquired characteristics, about which we discuss more later. Because wish fulfillment can never really satisfy a bodily need, except on a temporary basis, another component of personality must develop to make real satisfaction possible. And that component is the ego. As we have seen, the id, the id <laughs> attempts to reduce needs through hallucinations, mental pictures of objects that could satisfy a need. These, along with reflex actions, are called the primary processes. The primary processes of the id however, are ineffective in, ultim in ultimately alleviating the need. The id cannot distinguish between its images and external reality. In fact, for the id, its images are the only reality. The ego. Eventually, the ego, for the German das ich, meaning the I, develops the attempts to match the images of the id with objects and events in the real world. Freud called this matching process identification. The ego is governed by the reality principle and operates in the service of the id. In other words, the ego comes into existence to bring the person into contact with experiences that truly satisfy his or her needs. When the person is hungry, the ego finds food. When the person is sexually aroused, the ego finds appropriate sexual objects. When the person is thirsty, the ego finds liquid. The ego, through, ego goes through the process of reality testing to find appropriate objects. Because the ego is aware of both the images of the id and external reality, it operates on both the conscious and unconscious levels. The realistic efforts of the ego that bring about true biological satisfaction are called secondary processes, which contrasts with the ineffective primary process of the id. 
The relationship between the id and the ego is summarized in the following diagram. With Freudian theory, it's important to realize that the ego operates in the service of id. Freud compared it, this relationship to that between a rider, ego, and a horse, id. Sometimes the rider gets to make decisions about the path he or she will take. At other times, the more powerful horse determines the path. The superego. If the only two components of the personality were the id and the ego, we would have a hedonistic, animalistic person who, when in, need of, when in, in a need state, would seek immediate gratification of needs from appropriate environmental objects. The superego, a third component of the personality, makes this process more complicated, however. The superego, from the German das Ubrich, meaning the over eye, is the moral arm of the personality. It develops primarily from the internalized patterns of reward and punishment that the young child experiences. That is, depending on the values of the parents, certain things a child does or says are rewarded and thereby encouraged. Other things the child does or says are punished and thereby discouraged. Those experiences that bring reward and punishment are gradually internalized, and the superego is fully developed when self-control replaces environmental or direct parental control. The fully developed superego has two subdivisions. The conscious is internalized experiences for which a child has been consistently punished. Engaging in these behaviors now or even thinking about engaging makes a child feel guilty or naughty. The second subdivision of the superego is the ego ideal. That is, the internalized experiences for which a child has been consistently rewarded. Engaging in these behaviors now or even thinking about engaging them makes a child feel successful or proud. Although Freud believed the superego was strongly influenced by internalized personal experiences, he also believed it was influenced by historical or phylogenetic experiences. We see examples of this later in this chapter. The superego constantly strives for affection and is therefore as unrealistic as the eat. And any experience that violates the internalized value of the child is not tolerated by the superego. Now the job of the ego becomes more complicated. Not only must the ego find objects and events that satisfy the needs of the id, but it also must find objects and events that do not violate the values of the superego. It is no wonder the ego is called the executive of the personality. Freud described the task of the ego as an enormous burden of serving three severe masters, an attempt to bring their claims and demands into harmony with one another. First, there are the facts of objective reality, which may include pain and discomfort or more positive stimuli like delicious foods and attractive companions. The second master, the id, demands immediate gratification of its needs, but can only deal ex with external, external reality reflexively or through wish fulfillment. And these rarely, if ever, resolve the struggle with objective reality. The third master, the superego, presents the ego with the double-edged dilemma. Whatever the ego may do to engage the real world it is likely that the action will result in guilt, on one hand, because the action transgresses the prescriptions of the conscious, or shame on the other, because this does not meet the high standards of the ego ideal. Cathexis and Anticathexis Freud's most influential teacher at the University of Vienna was the renowned physiologist Ernst Bruch. Along, who, along with Hermann von Helmholtz and a few other physiologists, had revolutionized the field of physiology by purging physiology of all subjective, non-scientific concepts and terminology. Their goal was to explain all the physiological events in terms of known, measurable, verifiable physical events. That is, living systems were viewed as dynamic energy systems that obey the laws of physical universe. Vitali vitalism, or the belief that life consists of some vital force that cannot be reduced to physical events, was strongly opposed by these individuals. For them, there was no ghost in the machine that existed independently of physiological events and the laws that governed them. One Helmholtzian concept that Freud adopted was the principle of conservation of energy. This principle states that within a system, energy is never created or lost but only rearrange or transform from one place or form to another. The principle did not originate with Helmholtz, but he was the first to apply it to living organisms. For example, Helmholtz demonstrated the total energy expended by an organism equal the amount of energy associated with the food and oxygen it consumed. 
Freud applied this principle of conservation of energy to the human mind. According to Freud, each person is born with more or less the same amount of, of, of cyclic energy, or psychic energy, and that amount remains more or less the same from birth to death. This energy, however, can be transformed and rearranged, and it is how the energy is distributed at any given time that determines a person's personality characteristics. Freud used the term cathexis from the Greek cathexo, meaning to occupy. To describe, the investment of, to describe the investment of psychic energy into the thoughts of objects or processes that will satisfy a need. The energy itself never leaves the body, but if considerable energy is invested in the image of an object, an intense longing occurs for it in the form of thoughts, images, and fantasies. These thoughts and feelings continue until the need is satisfied, at which point the energy dissipates and is available for other cathexis Again, if only the, I, the id and the ego existed, humans would be animalistic. That is, a need would arise, an image wish of an object that would satisfy that need would form, and that wish would be endowed with energy, thereby creating a tension that would continue until the need was satisfied. There would be no, long, no regard for other people and no differentiation between acceptable and unacceptable objects with which to satisfy needs. As we have seen, however, with the development of the superego, comes the need to inhabit certain primitive desires. Freud called the energy expended to inhibit or control undesirable cathexis as anti-cathexis. Because the emergence of an unacceptable cathexis would cause anxiety, the ego and the superego often team up to create an anti-cathexis powerful enough to inhibit the strong primitive cathexis of the id. In such cases, the original need does not, does not disappear. Instead, the original cathexis is displaced to other, safer objects. Anxiety According to Freud, our most overwhelming experience of anxiety occurs when we are separated from our mother at birth. Freud called this experience the birth trauma, because we suddenly go from an environment of complete security and satisfaction to one in which the satisfaction of our needs is far less predictable. The feeling of helplessness following birth is, according to Freud, the basis of all subsequent feelings of anxiety. The function of anxiety is, its, is to warn us that if we continue thinking or behaving in a certain way, we will be in danger. Because anxiety is not pleasant, we will do what is necessary to reduce it. That is, we will find, we will find, we will tend to terminate those thoughts or actions that cause anxiety. Freud distinguished three types of anxiety. Reality re anxiety is caused by real, objective sources of danger in the environment and is the easiest type of anxiety to reduce because doing so solves problems objectively. For example, we don't drive during a snowstorm and we exit a building if we hear a fire alarm. Neurotic anxiety is the fear that the impulses of the id will overwhelm the ego and cause the person to do something for which he or she will be punished. Examples include becoming overly aggressive or giving in to one's sexual desires. Generally, this fear is one of becoming animal-like. Moral anxiety is a fear that the person will do something contrary to the superego and thus experience guilt. For example, if one has learned that being honest is good, then even thinking of being dishonest would cause moral anxiety. Neurotic anxiety is a fear that one will be punished externally or by other people for impulsive actions, whereas moral anxiety is a fear that one will be punished internally by feelings of guilt if the dictates of one's superego are violated. Thus, anxiety controls our behavior by causing us to avoid threatening experiences in the environment, to inhibit the impulse of the id, and to act in accordance with our internalized values. One of the ego's biggest tasks is to avoid or reduce anxiety. In addition to antikathexis, the ego has several other processes available to battle against anxiety. These processes are referred to collectively as ego defense mechanisms. Ego defense mechanisms. If normal rational approaches to the ego to reduce or remove anxiety are ineffective, the ego may revert to irrational methods called ego defense mechanisms. All ego defense mechanisms have two things in common. They are unconscious, that is, the person is unaware that he or she is using them, and two, they falsify or distort reality. Freud's daughter Anna was mainly responsible for elaborating the ego defense mechanisms, and we consider several of them. Repression. This is the most basic defense mechanism because for any of the other defense mechanisms to occur, 
repression must occur first. Freud wrote, wrote, the essence of repression lies simply in turning something away and keeping it at a distance from the conscious. Concerning the importance of repression, Freud said, the theory of repression is the cornerstone on which the whole structure of psychoanalysis rests. In an early version of this theory, Freud posited that repression kept disturbing memories away from the conscious. When he recanted the, the early theory, Freud reformulated the ideas about repression. In a commonly cited paper titled Repression, references to repression or memory do not appear at all. Rather than the mature theory, Freud made it quite clear that unconscious instincts, wishes, fantasies, and urges, rather than memories, were the targets of repression. Tense thoughts can be either those innately part of the id, in which case their repression is referred to as primal repression, or they can be unacceptable derivatives or substitutions for the original id impulse, in which case the repression is referred to as repression proper. Put simply, primal, re primal repression protects us from basic urges that may overwhelm us or put us in danger, while repression proper protects us from acting in unacceptable ways that could result in punishment. In either case, the ego keeps the potentially anxiety-provoking thought in the unconscious with an antikathexis whenever it threatens to reach consciousness. It is important to realize that what Freud considered to be innately part of the id. The primary, the primary drives that we, that we share with other animals are inherited as part of the id. But according to Freud, more is contained in the id than physiological needs. As we mentioned earlier, Freud was an ardent, ardent Lamarckian. That is, he believed we inherit memories of what our ancestors had learned from their experiences. Freud believed our id comes well stocked with inherited prohibitions because of the punishment our ancestors received for engaging in certain behaviors. Many of the events that cause anxiety in our lifetimes do so because of the experiences of our ancestors. Thus, we can fear castration, believe an adult sexually attacked us as children, and avoid incest, not necessarily because we learn these things, but because these thoughts are part of our phylogenetically inherited endowment. Freud believed that although the ego seems to operate in the present, certain activities transform themselves into experiences of the id, the impressions of which are preserved by heredity. Because the id is our reservoir of basic animal instincts, it can be inherited and passed from generation to generation, thus carrying those experiential memories with it. Thus, if our ancestors were consistently punished for certain activities, we are born with a tendency to inhabit those activities. The impulse to engage in those tendencies, incest or violence, continues to exist in the id. However, an energy must be expended to inhibit them or uh, inhibit them and related impulses. Another way to state Freud's position is to say that he believed at least part of human morality is inherited. In Totem and Taboo, Freud said, I have supposed that the sense of guilt for an action has persisted for many thousands of years and has remained operative in generations which can have no knowledge of that action. Freud's belief in Lamarck's concept of the inheritance of acquired characteristics also appears in his last book, Moses and Monotheism. He notes that our psychological lives are indeed a product of experiences accumulated since birth, but he also insists that at birth we also possess innate elements with a, with a phylogenetic origin, an archaic heritage. For Freud, the mechanism of repression was of vital importance because repressed thoughts do not stop having an influence on, an, on a personality. They simply are not readily available in consciousness. The whole purpose of procedures such as dream analysis, free association, hypnosis, and the analysis of slips of the tongue or memory lapses, which we discuss later, is an attempt to discover repressed thoughts so their effects on one's personality can be determined. Not all material in the unconscious mind is repressed, however. An abundance of information exists that is simply not relevant to a person at any given moment, such as names, telephone numbers, or dates. Although the person is not momentarily aware of this kind of information, he or she can easily become aware of it when needed. Such information is said to exist in the preconscious. Displacement. As we saw earlier, displacement is the substitution of one need satisfier for another. For example, the ego may substitute an available object for one that is not available, or it may substitute a non-anxiety-provoking object or activity for one that does cause anxiety. 
With displacement, what a person truly desires is repressed and is replaced by something safer. In his book called Civilization and Its Dis Discontents, Freud indicated that a civilization itself depends on the displacement of libidinal energy from one object to another. When a displacement results in something advantageous to civilization, it is called sublimation, such as when sexual impulses are displaced into such activities as painting, writing, building, or just plain hard work. Sublimation of instinct, wrote Freud, is an especially conspicuous feature of cultural development. It is what makes it possible for higher psych psychical activities, scientific, artistic, or ideological, to play such an important part in civilized life. All impulses can be displaced, even those associated with the death instinct. For example, the import, impulse towards self-destruction can be displaced to the destruction of others, and an aggressive impulse directed toward a threatening person, such as the boss or parent, can be displaced to less threatening objects, such as other cars on the street while driving home. Children, siblings, household pets, or quite commonly uh, to athletic teams opposing the hometown team. These are examples of displaced aggression, one of Freud's most influential concepts. Identification. Freud used the term identification in two ways. The one we have already covered in the process by which the ego attempts to match objects and events in the environment to the subjective wishes of the id. The term identification is also used to describe the tendency to increase personal feelings of worth by affiliating oneself psychologically with a person, group, or institution perceived as illustrious. The feelings of pride when the home team wins a game or when one's country wins a gold medal in the Olympics are examples. Choices of fashion, music collections, reading material, and even mannerisms can also exemplify identification if they bring a person closer psychologically to individuals perceived as successful, powerful, or attractive. Wearing t-shirts or jackets with team, business, or institutional logos also exemplifies identification. The child also identifies with his or her parents, internalizes their values, thereby eliminating the punishment that comes from having contrary values. This is primarily how the superego develops. Denial of reality. This mechanism involves the denial of some fact in one's life despite abundant evidence for its reality. Examples include the refusal to believe a loved one has died, the refusal to acknowledge the negative attributes of a loved one, the refusal to believe that one's poor driving was the cause of an accident, the tendency for some severely overweight and underweight individuals to, to deny they have eating disorders, and the tendency for people addicted to substances such as alcohol, nicotine, or cocaine to believe such substances will not harm them or that they could easily quit their habits. By definition, a person using the mechanisms of denial of reality is not in touch with at least some aspect of reality, and this could impair normal functioning. Projection. This mechanism is the one by which something that is true of a person and would cause anxiety if it were recognized is repressed and projected onto someone or someone, something instead of, else instead. For example, the statement, I want to go to bed with him, may be true, but because it causes anxiety, is converted into, he wants to go to bed with me. Also, the statement, I failed the test because I was unprepared, although perhaps true, is converted into statements such as, our textbook is terrible, she's the worst teacher I've ever had, or the test had trick questions. In general, projection is repressing anxiety-provoking truths about oneself and seeing them in others instead, or by excusing one's shortcomings by blaming them on environmental or life circumstances. Undoing. Here is a person or here a person performs an unacceptable act or thinks about doing so and then engages in ritualistic activities designed to atone for or undo the unacceptable act or thought. With undoing, it is if a person is attempting to magically undo one act with another. It is a kind of negative magic in which the individual's second act abrogates or nullifies the first. For example, after killing King Duncan, Lady Macbeth compulsively washes her hands as if to absolve herself of the heinous act. Likewise, a man, after physically abusing his wife, may attempt to undo the abuse by apologizing profusely to her, expressing his true love for her, or buying her a gift such as flowers. Reaction Formation this mechanism is the one by which objectionable thoughts are repressed and their opposites expressed. For example, 
the person who is most attracted to sexual materials may become an anti-pornography crusader, or the mother who really does not care much for a child may become overprotective. Freud believed that the clue in determining the difference between a reaction formation and true feelings is the degree to which the feelings are emphasized. People displaying a reaction formation tend to be more intense and extravagant in their emotions. In Shakespeare's Hamlet, the lady doth protest too much, and in so doing reveals her guilt. We need not look far to find examples of public figures exhibiting reaction formation. Consider the actions of a very public television evangelist, who would dramatically accuse most, if not all, of his audience of engaging in the sins of fornication and adultery. Imagine the shock that rumbled through the flock when law enforcement officials found the preacher, not once, but twice, trafficking with professional sex workers, committing his own acts of fornication and adultery. In a frenzy of Freudian defense, he also invoked projection to place the blame for his acts, not on himself, but on the devil. In the last few years, we have witnessed no fewer than four public officials, some serving at the national level, who have conducted conducted public and sometimes vicious campaigns against gay, lesbian rights, and same-sex marriage. For those who follow politics and Freudian defense mechanisms closely, disclosures of these officials' homosexual liaisons were not surprising. Rationalization Through this mechanism, the person rationally explains or justifies behaviors or thoughts that they may otherwise be anxiety-provoking. The ego excuses through logic, although faulty, Outcomes that would be disturbing if they were not explained in some way. The so-called sour grapes rationalization is quite common. Aesop, in about 500 BC, told of a fox that saw clusters of grapes hanging from a trellis vine. It tried everything in its power to reach them, but nothing worked. Finally, the fox turned away, saying the grapes were probably sour anyhow. Minimizing something to which one has aspired but failed to obtain is a common form of rationalization called sour grapes. Likewise, something that at first was not only that something that at first was not overly attractive may be glorified after it's attained. This has been called a sweet lemon rationalization. Intellectualization, also called isolation effect. Here an idea that would otherwise cause distress is stripped of its emotional content by intellectual analysis. Thus, a disturbing thought is not denied consciousness, but is denied the accompanying negative emotion. Using intellectualization, it is possible to ponder topics such as death, separation from a loved one, severe illness, or personal loss without the negative emotions typically associated with such events. For example, attempting to understand the medical nature of cancer in a logical, detached manner can minimize the emotional impact of a loved one having the disease. Likewise, the negative emotions associated with the death of a loved one can be minimized by emphasizing the thought that death is the inevitable consequence of life. Finally, one can minimize the distress typically associated with his or her house burning down by intellectually stressing the futility of becoming emotionally attached to material things. Regression With this mechanism, the person returns to an earlier stage of development when he or she expresses stress. For example, a child may revert to bedwetting or thumb-sucking when a new sibling is born. We have more to say about regression in our discussion of psychosexual stages of development, to which we return shortly. The ego defense mechanisms described earlier were those described by Freud and his colleagues and were summarized by his daughter Anna in her book, The Ego and the Mechanisms of Defense. In that book, however, Anna Freud offered two defense mechanisms of her own. One, altruistic surrender and two, identification with the aggressor. Altruistic surrender. Here a person minimizes the frustration and anxiety associated with making responsible decisions in life by vicariously identifying with another person perceived as superior and then living in accordance with that person's values. Identification with the aggressor. Here a person internalizes the values and mannerisms of a feared person, thereby reducing him or her as a threat. This mechanism, may explain why some hostages develop affection toward their captors, or a cycle of domestic violence develops. Anna Freud believed that this mechanism was instrumental in the development of superego. What else is a superego than identification with the aggressor? It should be made clear that everyone uses the ego defense mechanisms, and doing so in some moderation often facilitates normal functioning. Using one or more of them extensively, however, can be dysfunctional. 
Kramer discusses the ego defense mechanism within the context of contemporary cognitive and developmental psychology. He also discusses the circumstances under which the ego defense mechanisms are adaptive. Psychosexual stages of development. Freud believed that every child goes through a sequence of developmental stages, and the child's experiences during these stages determine adult personality characteristics. In fact, Freud believed that all, for all practical purposes, the adult, adult personality is formed by the end of the fifth year of life. Each state has an erogenous zone associated with it, which is the greatest source of stimulation and pleasure during the, that particular stage of development. To make a smooth transition from one psychosexual stage to the next, the child must neither must be neither ungratified nor overgratified, both of which cause a child to be fixated at that stage. A fixation occurs when a substantial amount of psychic energy remains cathetic in images of objects that can satisfy the needs corresponding to a particular stage of development. A fixation can occur either because the needs corresponding to a stage are consistently frustrated, ungratified, or are satisfied too often and too easily, overgratified. An example of the latter is an infant who is breastfed whenever it shows the least sign of hunger or discomfort. Fixation and regression go hand in hand because when a person regresses, he or she tends to go back to the stage at which the person had been fixated. In addition, persons who are fixated at a certain stage will, as an adult, display personality characteristics corresponding to that stage. We see examples of this next. Oral stage. The oral stage occurs during about the first year of life, and the erogenous zone during this stage is the mouth. During the oral stage, less than eight months old, Pleasure comes mainly from the mouth, lips, and tongue through the activities of sucking and swallowing. According to Freud, an adult who is fixated at the early oral stage engages in an abundance of oral activities such as eating, drinking, smoking, and kissing. This person also engages in activities that are symbolic equivalent, symbolically equivalent to those oral activities such as collecting things, being a good listener, taking in knowledge, or being what is labeled a gullible person, that is, a person who swallows anything he or she hears. Such a person is called an oral incorporative character. In the later oral stage, from eight months to about one year, experience is concentrated on the teeth, gums, and jaws, and pleasure comes from activities such as biting and devouring. An adult fixated at the later oral stage may be a fingernail biter and also would like eating. This person also would engage in activities symbolically equivalent to biting, such as sarcasm, cynicism, and ridicule. Such a person is called an oral sadistic character. Anal stage. The anal stage occurs during the, about the second year of life, and the erogenous zone is the anus buttocks region. During this stage, the child must learn to control his or her physiological pressures so they function in accordance with the demands of the society. That is, a child must be toilet trained. In the first part of the anal stage, pleasure derives from feces expulsion. Fixation at this level may result in an adult having physical problems such as a lack of sphincter control or inuresis. Symbolically, the person will be overly generous, wanting to give away nearly everything he or she owns, and may also tend to be creative. Such a person is called an anal expulsive character. In the latter anal stage, pleasure comes from feces possession. Fixation here may, be, may manifest itself physically in a problem with constipation, or symbolically in stinginess, parsimony, orderliness, and tendency toward perfectionism. Such a person is called an anal retentive character. Phallic stage. This stage occurs from about the third year of life to about the fifth year, and the erogenous zone is the phallus or penis. Although the phallus is a male organ, Freud believed the phallic stage described the development of both male and female children. Freud believed the clitoris was a small penis and therefore activity related to it such as clitoral masturbation was viewed as masculine in nature. The phallic stage is one of the most complicated and controversial Freud stages. He contended that during this stage, our subsequent adjustments to members of the opposite sex are determined. The phallic stage is a scene of the Oedipus complex, the resolution of which Freud believed has a profound influence on adult life. The Oedipus complex is named after an ancient play by Sophocles entitled Oedipus Rex, in which King Oedipus kills his father and marries his mother. According to Freud, both male and female children develop strong, positive feelings toward the mother because she satisfies their needs. For example, many of the breastfeeding and sexual contact from bathing and grooming, both male and female children develop erotic feelings toward their mother. 
These feelings persist in the boy, but typically change in the girl. The boy begins to fear the father as a dominant rival for his mother's affection, and this fear becomes castration anxiety. That is, the boy develops the fear of losing his sex organs because they are soon to be responsible for the conflict between him and his father. According to Freud, it is not necessary for a male child to be overtly threatened with castration to develop castration anxiety. Boys may have the opportunity to observe that girls do not possess penises and assume that they once did. That is, boys may believe that girls lost their penises because their penises, like their own, were the source of trouble with their father. Also, according to Freud, castration anxiety could result from the phylogenetic memory of actual castrations that occurred in the distant past. No matter what its source, castration anxiety causes the repression of the sexual desire for the mother and creates hostility toward the father. Next, the boy identifies with his father, thereby gaining vicarious satisfaction of his sexual impulses toward his mother. In a sense, the boy becomes the father and thereby shares the mother. By identifying with his father, the male child not only shares the mother, but he also accepts his father's notions of right and wrong as his own, thereby completing the development of his superego. That is, his father's morality becomes his morality. This process exemplifies what Anna Freud meant by identification with the aggressor and describes what was for Freud the healthy resolution of the Oedipus complex. The female version of the Oedipus complex is more complicated. Freud pondered calling the female version of the Oedipus complex the Electra complex after another play by Sophocles entitled Electra, in which Electra causes her brother to kill her mother, who had killed Electra's father. Freud rejected the idea, however, choosing instead to refer to the male and female Oedipal complexes. As we have seen, the female children also start life with a strong attraction to their mothers. This attraction is reduced, however, when the girl discovers she does not possess a penis. Whereas a male child assumes that female children once had penises and had lost them, the female child assumes that all other children possess penises, but for some reason she was deprived of one. The female child holds the mother responsible for purposely depriving her of this valued organ. The rejection of the mother is coupled with an attraction to the father whom she knows possesses the valued organ that she wants to share. Her positive feelings toward the father, however, are mixed with envy because, she, because he has something that she does not, and she is said to have penis envy. Freud leaves the girl suspended between the mother and father with positive and negative feelings toward both. Unlike castration anxiety in boys that is quickly repressed, Freud believed penis envy in one form or another could last for years. According to Freud, the female sexuality changes from masculine to feminine when she fantasizes about having her father's baby. It is this fantasy that explains the female impulse to reproduce rather than any maternal instinct. Of course, this impulse symbolically generalizes to other men and represents the healthy resolution of the female Oedipal complex. For Freud, the final resolution of the female Oedipal complex occurs when the female eventually has a baby, especially a male baby. The phallic stage is further complicated by the fact that both male and female children are bisexual. As we have seen, both male and female children begin with a strong sexual attraction toward their mother. This attraction typically persists in males and results in heterosexual development. However, because of this of his strong attraction toward his mother, the male child also imagines his father as a loved object and has erotic fantasies about him. Likewise, although penis envy causes the female child to turn from the mother to the father, the strong positive feelings she has toward her mother are not completely abandoned. Because male and female children identify with both their mothers and fathers, they possess both masculine and feminine characteristics. That is, they are bisexual. Freud considered bisexuality to be universal and normal. It is when life circumstances cause these natural impulses to become exaggerated that homosexuality results. According to Freud, all humans have the potential to become homosexual. Regression to the phallic stage for the male may include displaying many of the father's characteristics and also, typically, brashness and over-concern with masculinity and virility. Regression in the phallic stage for the girl may explain, exemplify penis envy-related activities. These activities may include seeking to share a penis, for example, promiscuity and seductiveness, or activities that symbolically castrate men, such as embarrassing, deceiving, or hurting them. The first three psychosexual stages, called the progenital stages, are by far the most important to personality development. As we mentioned earlier, Freud believed that the basic ingredients of the adult personality are formed by the end of the phallic stage. Latency stage. The latency stage lasts from about the sixth year to about the twelfth year. 
This is a time when sexual interests are repressed and displaced to substitute activities such as learning, athletics, and peer group activities. That is, during this stage, libidinal energy is sublimated. Uh, sublimated. General stage. This is the final stage of development and begins at puberty. At this time, the person emerges from the progenital stages as the adult he or she is destined to become. The child is sometimes transformed from a selfish, pleasure-seeking child to a realistic, socialized adult, typically with a heterosexual interest leading to marriage and perhaps child-rearing. If, however, the experiences during the progenital stages cause fixations, they will manifest themselves throughout the person's adult life. Supposedly, only psychoanalysis can dredge up the remains of these early experiences, which otherwise would remain repressed into the unconscious and cause the individual to face them rationally, thereby reducing their influence on his or her life. In fact, the process of psychoanalysis can be viewed as a means of discovering repressed thoughts that are having a negative influence on one's life. The question is, how does one gain access to thoughts that have been actively held in the unconscious mind all one's life? It is this question that we turn after summarizing Freud's views on feminine psychology. See Table 2-1 for a summary of these stages and corresponding events. Summary of Freud's view on feminine psychology. There is no doubt that Freud considered the psychology of women more enigmatic than that of men. He once commented to his friend Marie Bonaparte, the question, the great question that has never been answered and which I have not yet been able to answer, despite my 30 years of research into the feminine soul, is what does a woman want? But Freud tried strenuously to understand women via many approaches. At times, his proposed explanations emphasize the role of society in determining gender differences, seeing that women are inferior to males because society oppresses them. Most consistently, however, he claimed that anatomy is destiny, that is, gender differences have a biological origin. Freud persisted in viewing women as failed or inferior men. The cornerstone of his psychology of women remained penis envy. For males, the Oedipus complex is terminated by castration anxiety, causing them to identify with their fathers and to seek female partners in their adult lives. For females, penis envy commences the Oedipus complex, causing them to turn partially away from their mothers and toward their fathers as sexual objects. This switch of affiliation causes the female erogenous zone to change from the clitoris to the vagina because of the latter's origin, latter organ's involvement in reproduction. According to Freud, it is only after the erogenous zone changes from the clitoris to the vagina that the true feminine sexuality begins. Freud believed that the women could respond to their castration in three ways. One, they could later withdraw from sexual activity altogether, becoming frigid. Two, they could cling to their masculinity and become homosexual and embrace feminism, which he believed was characterized by masculine aggressiveness. Or three, they could symbolically take their father as a sex object, leading to heterosexuality and childbearing. Freud believed that because penis envy is not as intense as castration anxiety, Females do not have the same need to engage in defensive identification as males. Remember, it is a defensive identification with their fathers that completes the development of male superego. But what about the female? Freud believed the female does identify somewhat with her mother, mainly because of her fear of losing her love, but the identification is not nearly as intense and complete as it is for the male. The result, according to Freud, is that the female superego tends to be weaker than that of the male. That is, she is morally inferior. Even as Freud expressed his views on feminine psychology, he had many supporters and detractors. It is interesting to note that many of his supporters were female psychoanalysts. Likewise, many of his critics were male psychoanalysts. This is not to say, however, that all female analysts agreed with him and all male analysts disagreed with him. One of his most outspoken critics was Karen Horney, whose theory of personality we review in Chapter 5. In the end, Freud essentially admitted defeat in his attempts to understand women. Tapping the Unconscious Mind If repressed anxiety, provoking thoughts are effectively antithetic anti 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 by the ego or superego, how can we come to know what they are? To say the least, it is not easy, but it is the business of psychoanalysis to attempt to do so. Freud employed several methods of determining the contents of the unconscious mind, and we examine a few of them. Free Association Early in this chapter, we showed how the technique of free association gradually evolved to, the stimulate free to stimulate, stimulate free association, the fundamental rule of psychoanalysis. Freud instructed his patients to relate their thoughts to him, but to avoid self-censorship. 
he wondered that they might not want to talk about some things that came to mind because this or that is irrelevant here or is quite unimportant or nonsensical. But he instructed them to avoid those criticisms and speak about these thoughts precisely because you feel an adverse to do so, aversion to do, doing so. Freud insisted that because honesty and openness are essential conditions of therapy, nothing could be withheld. The idea that this was even in conscious expression, there are hints as to it, the contents of the unconscious mind that the trained observer can detect. What is not said is as important as, if not more than what is said. Topics to which patients offer strong resistance provide the analysis with useful hints to problem areas in the unconscious mind. One reason for Freud abandoned a hypotenuse is because a hypnotized patient does not display revealing resistances. During the course of free association, resistance can take the form of telling carefully constructed stories. Long periods of silence, refusing to say something considered by the patient silly or embarrassing, avoiding certain topics, the tendency to report events in a highly intellectual or unemotional manner, forgetting important insights that have been gained from previous therapeutic sessions, and hiding important thoughts behind excessive emotion. In addition, if the therapeutic process appears dangerously close to revealing anxiety-provoking material, the patient may be late for an appointment or not show up at all. To facilitate the flow of ideas, Freud had his patients lie on a couch in a dim room while he sat on the, out of the patient's view. Floyd remained out of sight for two reasons. One, he did not want his gestures and expressions to influence the patient's thoughts. And two, he could not tolerate being stared at for hours on end. At times, Freud demonstrated a rather cavalier attitude toward his therapeutic sessions. Early in his career, he wrote a letter to his friend William F Wilhelm Fleiss while one of his patients was under hypnosis. Later, he confessed to taking naps during his afternoon sessions presumably as his patients free associated. Dream Analysis Freud considered the interpretation of dreams to be his most important contribution, and it was the book that finally brought Freud the press professional recognition he had been seeking. Freud believed that it was in his dreams that the contents of the unconscious are most available, still hidden or distorted, but available. Indeed, Freud thought the interpretation of dreams is the royal road to knowledge of the unconscious activities of the mind. According to Freud, the dream is caused when the events of the day activate unacceptable impulses in the unconscious mind, causing them to seek conscious expression. At night, as the person sleeps, these impulses continue to seek conscious expression, but the ego realizes that if the contents of the dream are too threatening, they will cause a dreamer to awake prematurely. The ego, therefore, censors the impulses by driving them back into the unconscious. If these unacceptable impulses are ever to be consciously recognized, they must at least be at least partially camouflaged. Here we see Freud's revised view of repression in action. Freud referred, referred to the various mechanisms that make impulses more acceptable by distorting their meaning collectively as dream work. The two most important types of dream work are condensation and displacement. Condensation occurs when a dream element represents several ideas at the same time. For example, one person in a dream can represent several people in a dreamer's waking life. Displacement occurs when an unacceptable dream thought is replaced by a thought that is symbolically equivalent but is unacceptable, such as when penises become objects, such as baseball bats or flagpoles, breasts becomes mountains, balloons, or cantaloupes, and sexual intercourse becomes dancing or horseback riding, to give but a few examples. Freud believed most of the symbols that occur in a particular person's dream are derived from events in that person's life. Freud did believe, however, that some dream symbols were universal. For example, kings and queens symbolize mothers and fathers. Boxes, chests, and cupboards symbolize the womb. Walking up or down staircases, ladders, or steps symbolizes sexual intercourse. Haircutting, baldness, and decapitation symbolize castration. Small animals symbolize children, and long, stiff objects symbolize the penis. The symbols that occur in a person's dream can come from events in the person's waking life, from his or her childhood, or from the phylogenetic heritage of the human species. Again, we see Freud embracing Lamarck's notion of the inheritance of acquired characteristics. The dream work creates several disjointed symbols that have little meaning to the dreamer, and thus they are allowed past the sensor and enter consciousness. The dream symbols no longer cause anxiety because they represent unacceptable wishes, but they do cause anxiety for another reason. Because the rational, secondary processes of the ego seek to interact with the physical world in a logical, intelligible manner, the meaningless symbols attempting to enter consciousness after being acted on by the dream work cannot be tolerated. To make the material acceptable, the ego engages in what Freud called secondary revision. 
sometimes called secondary elaboration. That is, the ego synthesizes the symbols in some coherent fashion. It is this secondary vision that we recall as a dream. When we recall a dream, we describe its manifest content or about what it, happened, what it appeared to be. More important is the dream's latent content that consists of the repressed thoughts seeking expression. Dream work and secondary vision act on a dream to make its content more acceptable still, but latent meaning is always there for the trained observer to discover. Because dreams always contain at least some threatening material, the patient and therapist must work quickly before the contents are repressed again. The nature of dreams and the process of repression explain why the memory of dreams is so short-lived. Everyday Life In 1901, Freud published a book titled The Psychopathology of Everyday Life, in which he gave numerous examples of parapraxis, that is, the manifestation of repressed thoughts in the course of everyday living. Being a determinist, Freud believed all human behavior had a cause and that nothing happened simply by chance, not even accidents. Freud believed that believed little mistakes, such as temporary lapses of memory, provided information about the unconscious mind. For example, one may forget to potential, a potentially painful visit to the dentist or psychoanalyst. One may forget a date altogether or show up on Saturday instead of on a Friday, when the date actually was to occur. One may stop at a green light on the way to his or her mother-in-law's house. Slips of the tongue that have come to be known as Freudian slips are also thought to reveal unconscious motives. Legend had it that once Freud was introduced as Dr. Sigmund Freud, Zimbardo and Ruch reported that a radio announcer reading a commercial for Barber Ann Bread, instead of saying Barber Ann for the best bread, read Barber Ann for the breast in bed. Even actual incident accidents were thought in Freud by Freud to have meeting. After all, an automobile accident is, is a socially acceptable way of not getting somewhere. The main point here is that just because a thought is repressed does not mean it goes away. It is always there striving for expression. And these manifestations in everyday life are another way of getting a glimpse into the unconscious. Humor. According to Freud, humor allows the expression of repressed thoughts in a socially approved manner. In his books, Jokes and the Relation to the Unconscious, Freud indicated that through humor, a person can express aggressiveness, practical jokes, or sexual desires without the fear of retaliation by either the ego or the superego. Jokes, then, are like dreams in that both allow the com comprised expression of unacceptable impulses and both employ condensation, displacement, and symbolization. The purpose of both jokes and dreams is to satisfy unacceptable impulses indirectly that would be shocking if expressed directly. A joke that is too blatant fails to be humorous, just as the nightmare fails to preserve the sleep of the dreamer. In both cases, the impulses involved were not disguised enough. Also, jokes, like dreams, are usually forgotten quickly, for they too deal with dangerous material. In fact, for a joke to be funny, it must contain anxiety-provoking material. According to Freud, we laugh only at jokes that bother us. An examination of American humor shows sex, elimination, and death to be favorite topics, and this would indicate to Freudians that they contain an abundance of repressed thoughts. The Freudians say when we discover what has been repressed in a person's unconscious mind is to examine what he or she finds humorous. Modifications of the Freudian language, legend. Few would doubt that Freud was one of the most influential figures in human history. Recently, however, several researchers have provided information that requires substantial changes in the traditional view of Freud and his ideas. Freud's revision of his seduction theory. In April 96, Freud delivered a paper titled The Etiology of Hysteria, in which he concluded that hysteria is caused by sexual seduction that had been experienced by the patient in childhood. At this time, Freud reported, that, reported the seducers as nursemaids, governess, domestic servants, adult strangers, tutors, and in most cases brothers who were slightly older than the sisters they supposedly seduced. No mention was made of parents as seducers. Freud's address to his colleagues was met with total silence and he was urged not to publish his findings because doing so would damage his professional reputation beyond repair. Despite the warning, however, Freud published his article in 1896, and he continued to experience professional, emotional, and intellectual isolation. Even Wilhelm Fleiss, Freud's closest friend at the time, was not supportive of Freud's seduction theory. Freud abandoned his seduction theory in September 1897, although it was never scientifically refuted. The reasons for his abandonment are still a matter of speculation. In any case, Freud acknowledged that he had made a mistake in believing his patients believing his patients that a real seduction had occurred in their childhoods. 
His revised position was that the seductions were often imaginary. Freud later claimed that this change from real to imagined seductions marked the beginning of psychoanalysis as a science, therapy, and profession. It was only at this time that Freud claimed his patients reported parents, usually the father, as their seducers. It is now believed that this change was designed to make Freud's clinical observations compatible with his newly proposed edible theory. Keep in mind that when Freud recanted the, the sex, the, recanted the seduction theory, he changed his position on repression. Recall that in his revision, repression acts on urges and impulses rather than on memories. According to McNally, some therapists believe that Freud's original theory of repression, embodied in the, in the seduction theory, is much closer to the truth than his later mature theory. This therapeutic perspective holds that diverse symptoms may signal that the presence of repressed trauma and that helping patients recover these memories and process them emotionally is vital for restoring the patient's well-being. Jeffrey Mason, in his book, The Assault on Truth, Freud's Suppression of the Seduction Theory, explored possible reasons why Freud changed his belief from real to imaginary seductions and concludes he did so mainly because he lacked personal courage, not for any clinical or theoretical reasons. Mason suggests that the current sterility of psychoanalysis and psychiatry throughout the world has its origins in Freud's abandonment of seduction theory. He sees a therapeutic need to address an actual world of sadness, misery, and cruelty, rather than, as Freud's revision maintains, the dramatic invention of a child's imagination. Colombo points out that even after he abandoned the seduction theory, Freud continued to, imp to implicate nursemaids and governesses in the first sexual experience of children. She writes that it is the boys whom Freud consistently described as having experienced an actual seductions by maids, seductions clearly delineated off from fantasy by Freud. Recall that he may have been one of those little boys, perhaps his own trauma, carried over into his therapeutic practices. There is now convincing evidence that Freud entered into the therapeutic situations with a strong conviction that repressed memories of infant infantile abuse existed in his patients, and he manipulated events during therapy in ways that caused his conviction to be confirmed. Furthermore, evidence indicates that it was Freud's interpretations and reconstruction of his patient's responses that were offered as evidence for his beliefs, rather than anything his patients actually said. For example, Esterson says, A consideration of all the evidence points to the conclusion that Freud's early patients, in general, did not recount stories of infantile seduction. These stories were actually analytic reconstructions which he foisted on them. Similarly, Webster concludes there was no evidence that any of the patients who came to Freud without memories of sexual abuse had ever suffered from such abuse. According to McNally, Freud relentlessly tried to convince his patients that they had, in fact, been sexually abused early in childhood. During the 1980s and 1990s, there was a resurgence of therapies focused on recovery of memories. Contemporary researchers are concerned about the widespread search for repressed memories. Elizabeth Loftus, for example, wonders why so many individuals enter therapy without memories of abuse but leave with them. She speculates that often it is suggestions made by therapists that make the difference. She suggests that what is considered to be present in the client's unconscious mind might actually be present solely in the therapist's conscious mind. Researchers such as Loftus do not deny that many children are sexually abused or that therapy can help them deal effectively with such experiences. It is the notion of repression and the techniques used to recover repressed memories that are being questioned. Many tortured individuals live for years with a dark secret of their abusive past and only find the courage to discuss their childhood traumas in the support of an emphatic environment of therapy. We are not disputing those memories. We are only questioning the memories commonly referred to as repressed memories that did not exist until someone went looking for them. Allegations of childhood sexual abuse based on recovered memories became so widespread that the False Memory Syndrome Foundation was created in 1992 to investigate and assess such charges. The American Psychological Association approved the FMSF as a provider of information concerning so-called recovered memories of abuse, and it continues to serve this important function today. Evaluation. Empirical research. Many attempts to val the many attempts to validate Freudian ideas experimentally have produced mixed, have produced mixed results. In his review of numerous studies, J. McVicker Hunt found a support for Freud's contention that early experience is important to molding adult personality, but little support of the influence of specific psychosexual stages, as Freud described them. In his review, Maddie found considerable support for the various mechanisms of defense postulated by Freud, especially repression. 
Maddie also found evidence that boys experience more castration anxiety than do girls. Silver and Bloom and Hall and Van Castle also found more castration anxiety in boys relative to girls and the reverse for penis envy. Klein reviewed more than 700 studies designed to test Freudian notions and concluded that Freudian theory could not be rejected on the basis of the research designed to test it because too much that is distinctly Freudian has been verified and there are a few good experiments which actually refute the theory. Fisher and Greenberg reached a similar conclusion. Scanning the spectrum of tests we have applied to Freud's theories, we are generally impressed with how often results have borne out his expectations. Although responding to the frequently made assertion that Freudian notions are too nebulous to be tested, Fisher and Greenberg said we have actually not been able to find a single systematic psychological theory that has been frequently evaluated scientifically as have Freud's concepts. Currently, there's a debate over the emerging field of neuropsychoanalysis. This field attempts to prove some of Freud's theory using a more biological assessments, such as MRIs and PET scans. Case studies continue to be substituted to, submitted to journals, and updated research on defense mechanisms also exists. Research attempts to validate Freud's theories may not disappear in the near future, but neither will his influence on current validated approaches to therapy. Criticisms. Freudian theory can be criticized for being internally inconsistent, demonstrating male chauvinism, example, girls long to have a penis, overemphasizing sexual motivation, overemphasizing unconscious motivation, being too pessimistic about human nature, example, humans are basically aggressive and irrational, and equating the ultimate state or happiness with a tension-free state that results when all of one's biological needs are satisfied. Critics also claim that although a few Freudian concepts have been supported by empirical research, most of his important notions remain untestable. About psychoanalytic theory in general, Stanovich says, adherents of psychoanalytic theory spend much time and effort in getting the theory to explain every known event from individual quirks of behavior to large-scale social phenomena. But their success in making the theory a rich source of after-the-fact explanation robs it of any scientific utility. Dawes, a leading figure in precise discipline of mathematical psychology and long-term critic of poor practice in psychotherapy, has pointed out an additional problem plaguing many Freudian concepts. In this case, he considers the idea of oral fixation and the development of oral character. According to the theory, an oral fixation develops due to deprivation, overindulgence, or an unfortunate inconsistency during the oral stage of psychosexual development. The oral character that results can be oral incorporative, in which an individual may appear passively gullible and swallow everything, or it can be oral sadistic, in which the individual can be verbally abusive, sarcastic, and biting. Given that there are three possible causes and two possible outcomes, Dawes knows that there are six possible combinations of cause-outcome pairings that might explain oral character. He points out that these constitute every conceivable combination, that no matter what occurs, we can interpret it as supporting the idea of childhood determination of adult psycho psychopathology. We returned once again to Popper's idea that good theories make risky predictions and thereby risk ref refutation. As Dawes points out with respect to the development of the oral character, all the possibilities are accounted for and the whole argument becomes irrefutable. Scientific theory aside, even in therapeutic practice, Freud can be elusive. If the therapist suggests a construction, an interpretation, of the source of a patient's neurosis, the patient can agree and the therapist is correct. If the patient disagrees, he or she is exhibiting repression which is also indicated that the therapist is correct. This has been referred to as a problem of unassailability. Most often, Freudian theory attempts to explain events after they have occurred. That is, the theory engages in post-diction rather than prediction. As we saw in chapter one, if a theory does not generate risky predictions, it cannot be falsified, and therefore, according to Popper, it is not scientific. Contributions. Despite the many criticisms of Freud's theory, many would agree that its overall value is positive. Freud contributed to our understanding of personality by demonstrating the importance of anxiety as a determinant of human behavior by showing that, phys that physical and physiological disorders can have a psychological as well as physiological origins, by showing that conflicts originating in childhood have lifelong consequences, by showing the importance of childhood sexuality and personality development, by showing that many ways, the many ways that persons have defended themselves against unbearable anxiety, by showing that much normal behavior is determined by the same processes that determine abnormal behavior by showing that many human problems result from the clash between the selfish biological nature of humans and our need to live harmoniously with other humans in society, and by developing a technique for treating persons experiencing unbearable anxiety. Freud has provided us with a general framework with which to study personality, 
Although portions of Freud's theory may be incorrect or vague or difficult to test, the theory has raised questions that researchers have attempted to answer ever since. As we point out at the beginning of this chapter, few people in history have had the impact on human thought that Freud has. No major category of human existence has been untouched by his ideas. For example, he has influenced religion, philosophy, education, literature, art, and all the social sciences. What follows in this text can be understood mainly as a reaction to Freud. Some theories support and extend his thoughts, and others refute them. But it was Freud who was the first, and that is always the most difficult. Summary. And here's a summary. I'm going to leave it here for you to read on your own. I would encourage you to kind of look back at what you've read already and read the summary as a way of wrapping up these ideas so you can see the main points and highlight and underline what's most important. So here's the first page of the summary. And the second, we'll roll here and scroll down. And then we'll go back up to the top so you can see the next column and scroll down to the bottom and that should be all.